så där ja. Då är klockan 12 och det är dags att starta igen vår nästa installationsföreläsning. Och jag säger hej och välkomna till de som är nya i publiken och för er andra säga hej igen. So, hi and welcome to this installation lecture uh, that Professor Axel Hagerman will uh, hold in the subject atmospheric science and he will soon just tell, he, tell a little bit more about uh, himself. Uh, I am going to share this session today and I am Lena Abrahamsson, I am Dean at the Faculty of Science and Technology here at LTU, Luleå University of Technology. Uh, for those that have not been on an installation lecture before, I can just say you this, this type of lectures, they are held by all our new professors every year. Uh, and it's a type of lecture where we learn something basic from the research area and also something from the state of the art. And it will be a mixture of, of those. Uh, and this installation lectures, they are held in connection to our big academic ceremony that will be on Saturday, where uh, we will meet again, and uh, we will have a, a, a big academic party. So we look forward to that. But today it's more serious. We will listen to a lecture, uh, and it will be uh, perhaps a time for a few questions in the end, uh, and we will listen to uh, to, to the ice and rocks in space. And I look very much forward to listen to you. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Lena. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, the research that we do at LTU um, at uh, Kiruna Space Campus, where we've got a lab now. It's about ice and rocks in space. And um, I I'll start off by showing you a picture. Um, so um, the question to the audience now is because this is interactive, what are we looking at? Are we looking at, at ice? Are we looking at rocks? I mean, what does it look like? Can anybody tell me? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I've got ice and rocks, you know. <laughs> Would you like a rock? Ice. ice. OK, why do you think it's ice? It's orange. <laughs> okay, now, um, you are actually right. I mean, th these pebbles, I mean, they're not granite, they're not sandstone. Um, th this picture was taken 15, 16 years ago on, on Saturn's moon Titan. Now, that is, you know, on the outer outskirts of the solar system. Um, it's very, very cold there. And uh, this is actually, you know, what on Earth would be sort of a dry riverbed. And um, these pebbles that we're looking at, they're, they're made of water ice. And um, because the temperatures are so cold, we're looking at stuff at minus 180 degrees Celsius. It, it looks like rocks. Um, and the liquid that shaped this riverbed was most likely methane. So there was once a methane river flowing on Saturn's moon Titan that deposited all these pebbles there, which are actually not rock. It's all water. Yeah. And, and that is basically what I want to talk to you about in, in the next uh, 35 minutes or so. I'm, I'm afraid I have to show you three geeky physics -y graphs. I mean, this is one of them. And um, I, I need to talk a bit about states of matter to explain what ices actually are, at least you know, how we define ices. Well, you know that most substances can have three different states, namely as a solid, and as a liquid, and as a gas. And it's pressure and temperature that determine what the state they're in. Like if you increase the temperature, you know, ice melts, then eventually you know, if, if you boil water, you know, or if you heat water, it boils. So basically, um, th there is one point that determines like where, where a substance is in its, its state. It's the so-called triple point. At that point, actually, any, any substance can actually be become like either a solid or a liquid or a gas, depending on where the pressure and where the temperature goes. Um, so for our purposes, just to make a definition to start with, ice are substances whose triple point uh, temperatures are one degree Celsius, uh, below one degree Celsius. And rock forming minerals have got much, much higher triple points. So rocks, in what we looked at, the pebbles, they were not rock, they were ice, because they were made of water ice. And, and the question then is, why, why do we look at, at stuff like ices in the solar system? Now, and by ices, I mean particular materials like uh, water, carbon dioxide, and methane. Carbon dioxide ice, most people know from clubs or so, it's, it's known as dry ice here on Earth. 
And now that's because ices are, are ubiquitous in the solar system. You can find them in the entire outer solar system. Um, Earth, Mars, we now think there's ice on the moon as well. Um, ices are quite important um, because they help control the planet's climate. I mean, our Earth would look very, very different without all the water that basically can turn either into a vapor or into a liquid or become an ice sheet. Um, then ices actually, you know, once they approach the sun from the outer solar system, they can become very spectacular comets, like the one that you see in this picture. And also ices are very important because they can support these environments that are um, supportive of life, like on Earth. Um, we don't know a lot about ices. I mean, we, we don't know a lot about some landforms on Mars. Um, we, we don't quite know how, how comets can be hard and soft at the same time, what makes asteroids stick together. And, and um, so there are many open questions. And, and what we do in, in our lab is basically we, we look at combinations of ices and rocks in a laboratory. And the lab is in Kiruna. Well, Kiruna is cold, but not quite cold enough for this kind of research. Um, so basically we try to simulate the, experiment, uh, the environmental conditions on Mars, so much colder than Kiruna, uh, on comets or asteroids, much less air than in Kiruna. Um, random place on Earth we can do as well. And we try to examine the ice and rock behavior on, on centimeter to decimeter scale. So most of our samples are, are this size. And we use that to, to basically to confirm theoretical models and to explain spacecraft data. So we, we see ourselves as something you know, doing physics between astronomy and, and uh, uh, standard you know, microscale physics. Um, let's take a look at you know, where we fit in with, with space missions. And these are all missions that have pretty much relied on experimental data from these simulations to explain what they found. It started in 2005 when it basically lab experiments helped explain the data from Saturn's moon Titan. Uh, continued with the Rosetta mission, then we looked at asteroid Hugo and, and basically helped with instruments there. Um, we explained some processes on Mars, and um, we helped with some instruments there, and we're ho hoping actually to play some role uh, when, when Mars Moon Phobos gets explored by the next mission of the Japanese Space Agency. Um, how do we create these space environments? Um, well, it's, the principle is very, very simple. Um, we've, we've got a vacuum chamber, there's no air in space. If we've got a planetary atmosphere, we need to you know, carefully just provide this atmosphere through, a, for instance, CO2 line for Mars. Um, then we cool things down with liquid nitrogen because it's very, very cold. And if you want to heat things up in space, we use the sun. We've got an artificial sun. And so that's our lab, but I, I talked to you about space, so I, I'll take you on a tour through space. And, and these are my two colleagues, uh, Erika and, and Alex, who are inviting you to step into our vacuum chamber to explore space. So we're not using a rocket right now, we're using a vacuum chamber. And I'll give you a quick tour of ices and rocks in the solar system. So I mean, I'll show you the route that you'll be taking. I mean, we're here, yeah, we are Earth. And we've already been to Titan, so that's out there. And um, basically, we start on Mars. And then we'll take um, a tour route that looks a bit like this. So I mean, uh, the trajectory is not physically accurate, but I mean, we're going out to comets and coming back. Um, ice is on Mars. Um, on Mars, we can see both carbon dioxide ice, so dry ice, and water ice. And uh, carbon dioxide ice is the most abundant ice on Mars. It's also, you know, carbon dioxide is very abundant in Mars' atmosphere. And, and there is a very active carbon dioxide cycle on Mars. That means, you know, the carbon dioxide is transferred between the atmosphere and the poles. Like, you get winter and summer, and the pole cups shrink and, and, and uh, wax as well. And um, ices are linked to some of the most active geological features on the Martian surface. Um, and that is because of, of their behavior under these specific conditions. Um, they, ices tend to be transparent. Carbon dioxide ice and water ice in slabs, they tend to be transparent or translucent for uh, most visible wavelengths of radiation. That means sunlight can penetrate these ices and it can heat dark particles um, within and below the ice. And that means the subsurface of an ice sheet can become warmer than the surface of an ice sheet if you shine the sun at it. And that is very, very important. So actually, we get something like a solid-state greenhouse effect when you've got these ice sheets. And carbon dioxide ice is very special in, in that it's more transparent than water ice. And that means you can get some really bizarre landforms on Mars that you cannot recreate on Earth. And I'm, I'm going to show you one of these. I mean, that was found on, on NASA's earlier Mars missions in the near equator, equatorial regions. You, you get some really odd features because that's where a lot of this carbon dioxide exchange happens. And th these are basically negative features. That means they're you know, dug into the ground and you've got these spider-like uh, structures there. They, they were you know, nicknamed spiders by, by the early scientists. 
and, and it's basically a sort of a crater, it's central depression about 50 meters in size, and then it's got these legs expanding like a few hundred meters from, from the central crater. Now, we don't find anything like that on Earth and, uh, Earth, and the question is, what is so specific about Mars that you get these landforms on Mars but not on Earth? And uh, the hypothesis on this was that um, basically it is related to this solid-state greenhouse effect that I showed you before. So they form underneath a carbon dioxide ice sheet, and basically, you've got the sun, as you can see in, in, in the cartoon to the, to the uh, right. Yeah, yeah, the sun shines through this ice sheet. It impinges on the surface. It heats up the surface below the ice sheet. That means the lower part of the carbon dioxide ice sublimates. It cannot melt because the pressure is too low. And that means you've got a, this increase in vapor pressure. And at some point, basically, the ice ruptures under the pressure and the, the gas escapes. And as it escapes, it takes all those dust grains with it. Now, um, really obscure process. There have been some models explaining, okay, we think this is how it could work, um, but basically the, it was waiting for, for confirmation. I mean, can we really eject Martian dust from a Martian ice cap by this process? So is the pressure enough? Can we get enough energy in through the sun? And so we, we, we try this in the lab. I mean, the, our science question was basically, can we eject Mars from a dust Mars polar cap? So we, we created a small polar cap on Mars. It was only 15 centimeters by 15 centimeters. Then we put a carbon dioxide, uh, a carbon dioxide ice. Then we put some you know, Mars analog dust into the center of it. Um, and then we shown uh, the, the sun at it at atmospheric pressures that equate Mars atmospheric pressures. Um, that's what we needed. So carbon dioxide ice, we can make that. Um, Mars dust is more difficult. I mean, you know, we can't just buy Mars dust, but we can get analogs. So effectively, what we did, we, we used a fake sun in a fake Mars atmosphere um, to, to basically shine on a, on a fake polar cap with fake Mars dust. Uh, that, that's a, a sort of pessimistic way of looking at it. But the thing is, in these conditions, we can control every parameter that we've got, and that's basically what understanding scientific processes is about. We can control everything. We've got an analog sun that we can control. We can control our atmosphere, and we can make it basically very, very similar to Mars. And I'm going to show you a quick movie in, with uh, this fake Mars cap that we've got. So this is a cylinder 15 centimeters by 15 centimeters, and I've actually drawn these, these red areas because that's where you can actually see um, the the dust escape from this Mars polar cap. And it's actually the dust layer is right in the center of this thing. And we'll now basically shine the sun at this and watch as the pressure inside increases and then ejects the gas and the dust. And you can see it both on the, there you are. It gets dark, I mean, Mars dust tends to be red. And you can also see it on the right because there was a weak point in, in the structure of the ice at the side as well. I made it come out of the side as well. There you go, and here comes the dust. Ejected purely because of the pressure inside the ice. Um, th there's a lot of parameters that, that are involved in this. It was very difficult to create these conditions. I mean, it depends on ambient pressure, ice temperature, overburden, ice thickness. Mechanical strength of the ice is very important because we, we saw this bit um, basically ejected at the side because there the ice wasn't quite strong enough. So that also, uh, in a way, shows why these spiders on Mars are so rare and, and restricted to certain regions, because it's very difficult to get just the right conditions for these kind of um, experiments or for these kind of, of processes. Um, so having looked at, at these processes on Mars, um, I'll, I'll now take you a bit further out in the solar system. Um, so we've been here. Uh, let's take a look at ISIS and related to comets. Now comets, I need to explain to those who are not familiar with it what they are. Um, comets are very icy. I mean, they are solid cores of ice and dust. And, and they orbit the sun on a very, very eccentric orbit. That means they approach the sun from far out in the solar system and get closer. And as they get closer, the, the ice obviously is uh, subjected to the sunlight. And that's when, when these comet denuclei, as they're called, and they, they form a sort of um, uh, atmosphere, which we call the coma. And then the sun, the solar wind comes and basically takes the material from the coma with it. And you can actually see these tails for the comets. I mean, on the left, you've got a, a nice picture of actually how spectacular it looks. And when I talk about comets, I mostly mean comet nuclei, that's just a scientific detail. Um, but wh why are these comets interesting? And, and that's because they've got a, a really cool history. Be they, they have probably formed you know, a long, long distance away from the sun, so they were born very cold. They, they basically were a, a lumps of material in the outer solar system uh, that formed far away a long time ago. 
so, and they have remained there most of the time, so they have remained cold. Um, they, they're very, very small, so they haven't seen any sort of physical compaction or so. And so, so we think actually these are like cosmic freezers, these, these, these comets. They, they basically provide us with material from the early stages of the solar system. And it was so interesting that the European Space Agency invested the better part of, of 1 billion euro, I think, to fly a space mission to explore a comet. And uh, the target comet was Comet 67P. And this mission, actually the Rosetta mission, uh, was approved in 1993. It was launched in 2004, which gives you an idea of the timescales involved in this. And then it took it 10 years to get there. So, you know, after about 20 years, actually, Rosetta arrived at the target comet. And then it delivered a lander um, also in 2014. And the lander, I mean, you can see it on the side of this spacecraft here. Uh, I'll just um, blow this up a bit. So that's the, the, the Philae lander. And it was designed to actually to land on, on the comet, actually measure the physical and chemical environment of, of this comet nucleus. And the science questions that drove this was actually, what is it made of? I mean, how, how, how does it work? You know, what, what drives its activity? And what is the material um, of, of this comet nucleus? And actually, there was a little in instrument there. Um, it was a hammering probe that was supposed to measure the temperature and also the hardness of this material. Um, now, this is very abstract. I mean, ESA fortunately at that point decided that they want to make their missions more accessible, and they came up with these fantastic cartoons. Um, so, um, if you Google, like for, for once upon a time Rosetta, you can actually see 24 minute videos of, or animations of this little Rosetta guy and a little Philae on top actually going to this comet. And it's, it's you know, I, I tend to show like a three minute cut, I can't unfortunately this time. So, just the most important sort of shortcuts uh, to this. So, um, approved in 1993, you can see the precursor mission of Rosetta here as a grandpa. Um, then it was launched in 2004. So these things are actually historically accurate. And um, arrived at Rosetta in 2014. That's where the lander is dumped. Um, this is a farewell picture of the lander landing on the nucleus, and that's the landing. Now, you, you will probably go, oh, this is just for children and so on, but it is so accurate that actually this picture exists, yeah? not, not just in cyberspace. So this is this picture that Rosetta took of the lander basically descending onto the comet. So th these are very, very good ways of actually um, sort of visualizing what went on. And now I need to get back to the science question. So what were comets thought of to be like before Rosetta? And they were thought to be sort of icy rubble. They break up easily, we can see that, you know, comets break up uh, under any kind of stress. Um, so people thought that comets must be soft. Now how did Rosetta change that? So let's look at the, uh, take a look at the Rosetta science results that we got. And um, I'll demonstrate one of the science results using this animation from ESA. It was a landing, and the landing happened like this. So you can see that the Rosetta lander, Philae, actually had a bit of a problem getting down onto the surface. And it bounced off the surface again, and finally it came to rest. Yeah, obviously it's relieved now. So um, that's the animation. Uh, the reality looked like this. So, um, the, actually, it was very good taxpayer um, you know, value for money because we got four landings for the price of one, effectively. Um, what we found was that Rosetta uh, discovered that comets can be hard in places. Now, for these soft things that break up easily, that was quite surprising. Um, there was another observation that Rosetta's lander made, and that was using this hammer I told you about that looked like this. So the hammer actually didn't manage to, to penetrate the comet nucleus. And that's what is shown on the second geeky graph here. Basically, it shows nothing, nothing just noise. The hammer hammering, nothing happens really. So we found that, I mean, comets not only can be quite hard in like three, four places, they can be very, very hard in at least one place. And those were sort of new discoveries. And this is where, where our lab comes into play, because we wanted to understand, okay, how can we reconcile these two hypotheses? How can we make a comet you know, be soft and hard at the same time? Um, how can we create something that is you know, ice-rich, you know, because comets are very, very icy, but the surfaces are ice-poor? So we created a fake comet, just like we created a, far, a fake Mars cap. Um, we used a vacuum chamber, we used an artificial sun again, we used loose snow, very, very loose material, and we artificial snow, and then we used some soot just to darken the ice. And um, we weren't the first to do this. I mean, people did this 20 years before us. But this was probably the simplest um, experiment that anybody had come up with. 
And so I'm going to show you the behavior of our, our fake comet as it approaches the sun. And um, so this is, again, our sample. It's very similar um, uh, dimensions to the previous sample, 15 by 15 centimeters. And this is our sample surface of our comet. And now we're switching on the sun, and we're approaching the sun from the outer solar system. Um, it is, of course, a time lapse. And what we, the first thing we see is that the comet becomes active. That means it ejects all its dust. And what we see is a very active, very icy surface that is very bright. And it's the water vapor pressure that is basically driving all the surface material away. And as we now penetrate the ice, the sunlight gets absorbed by the black particles in the ice. I mean, it's just carbon, the simplest material likely to have been out there in the outer solar system. And we speed this up a bit, and as we can see that these black particles then cluster together and fun, fun, fill these clumps, basically, that assemble on the surface. And on the surface, we get um, something that looks like bright spots and dark spots, and the dark spots keep growing and they keep moving. So it's a very active surface with a very dark material that looks rather fractal. I mean, you've got these fairly you know, stable clumps. You can actually lift them up with a spoon, and they form, and the, also our comet shrinks. So we've created a sort of very dark surface on what actually was a very, very white material to start with. Um, Another thing that we've observed is then that basically a lot of it depends on the, like the type of mixture that we use. I mean, how much ice and how much dust do we mix? And that determines the outcome of this, how, how dark the surface becomes. We then uh, went on because another science question was like, uh, how hard can this material become under, under, under sunlight? And um, the observation was actually also like by just adding a bit of dark material to the very, very fluffy snow, we can actually make it become very, very hard at depth. That's because of a process called sintering. And we, we find that it's very, very critical to add the right amount of black soot to this um, white material to actually make it become hard. So we have created something that is mainly ice and that is very dark on the surface that basically spits out lots of water vapor that becomes um, hard at depth, but is very soft in other places. Now, um, I'll tell you a bit more about the limitations of these experiments. I mean, these are two pictures juxtaposed. One is from the Rosetta mission, looking at a comet surface, like this is Comet 67P. On the right-hand side, you can actually see um, our model comet in the lab. And this looks surprisingly similar. You go, oh yeah, well, I mean, yeah, Truly, you've solved comets. Well, there is a catch to this. I mean, the, the little square there you can see, I mean, that's about two by two meters, and what's inside that square is actually the Rosetta lander. That's Philae. You can see that here. So that is the scale of this picture, and this is the scale of our picture. So obviously, there is quite a bit of research that still has to be done. But still, we think that we are actually, you know, try to, to explain something that is relevant on comets, actually how we can reconcile the hard and the soft material on comets. Um, comets have got very closely related cousins. They're called asteroids, uh, which are basically um, also kind of rubble piles left over from the early stages of the solar system. So, I mean, from the comets, we then you know, go into sort of reverse gear and go back to the asteroid belt and, and take a look at these asteroids. Um, why, why are asteroids interesting? Because, I mean, they are just left over rubble from, from the very, very violent past of our solar system. Effectively, they are just, you know, sort of early planets smashed to bits. They, they uh, tend to be quite important for us, though, because, I mean, this, this rubble um, occasionally hits Earth, and, and we pick it up as meteorites. Now, um, I brought one of them with me um, just to demonstrate. This is a random meteorite, well, not so random. And um, they're also quite relatively easily accessible as resources in space. I mean, if you fly a space mission to an asteroid, you can exploit it. You don't have, don't have to do any of the sort of major, say, mining activities because the material is right there at the surface and accessible. Because actually, asteroids in space, um, like, like sort of um, this stuff here, it, that, that's iron that is already reduced. So you don't have, have iron ore that needs to be processed and so on. You've got this material sitting there in lumps in space. All you need to do is pick it up, which is why actually a lot of companies have become quite interested recently in exploiting these resources in space. Um, so that, that's why asteroids are interesting. Um, 
I'll go a bit more detail about other more dangerous aspects in, in a few minutes. Um, there was a mission to an asteroid called um, Hayabusa 2 by the Japanese Space Agency. That was launched in 2014, and because asteroids are not as far away from the Sun as, as comets tend to be, um, it arrived after only four years and it delivered a little lander that was um, built by the German Aerospace Agency. Um, and it also took a sample from the asteroid. And this sample um, actually was possibly the most spectacular part of the mission, which is why I'm going to show a little animation of that, because the sample was taken by firing a projectile and then using a big cone to just collect the material that was ejected by the projectile fired into the asteroid. Now, this thing selected the sampling site, dropped some target mappers, and then basically because it is so far away from Earth, you can't actually control it from Earth, all the sampling was done autonomously, uh, which is quite impressive. And uh, then um, Hayabusa 2 returned that sample to Earth. Now, um, what does that have to do with our lab? Um, well, fortunately, we were in a position that actually we could provide the right conditions in this lab for a, a thermal radiometer to, to be calibrated. And uh, this um, radiometer landed uh, on the asteroid, and uh, basically it, uh, we, we helped characterize this instrument because we can create these regular conditions. And thermal measurements on, on asteroids are rather important because they tell us a lot about the, the, the structure of the material. Um, I need to tell you a bit about the physics of this. Uh, solid materials tend to warm and cool very, very slowly. If you shine the sun at it, and, and then if you turn the sun off, they cool very, very slowly. That means they can retain heat very well. And porous materials tend to cool and warm very, very quickly. And you can do this thought experiment by just putting a brick and then some dust into the sunlight, and you will find that the brick basically will you know, keep a very, very stable temperature. And dust basically will heat up, the surface will heat up very, very quickly, and it will cool down very, very quickly. Now, what, what the Hayabusa 2 mission found was that asteroid Yugu has a surface that warms and cools very quickly. And this is you know, one of the cameras, the thermal camera on, on board this, this asteroid mission that observed the temperature of the material. So it was a th like a thermal camera um, that we were involved in. And basically, it turned out that, that Yugu actually has material that is very, very fluffy. So it's got a very, very high porosity. And this material is, in fact, so so porous that it would be very, very difficult for this material to actually make it through the Earth's atmosphere and then impact Earth. Now, that is quite relevant because actually we, we think that material like this, so this is a meteorite, actually these things are very, very closely related to asteroids like Hugo. We actually think that you know, this, this is the sort of thing that comes from these things. So this obviously has made it through the atmosphere. And it is, well, not that porous. It's, it's reasonably lightweight, but it's not that porous. This material would just break up. So we would not find samples of this. And why does that matter for us? Um, well, and first of all, let's, let's finish the Japanese mission and, and take the sample home. Um, so th these, are, these guys actually are now practicing um, the collection of the sample. The sample arrived, by the way, in, in, in December uh, last year. And Asteroids are quite important, well, firstly, for resource utilization. I mean, it's this kind of stuff, for instance, that you're after when you're in space, and you also you know, can find you know, important resources and rare resources in, in these rocks. Um, it's also such that um, we pick these things up. These are very, very small. They keep hitting us, and some of them are quite big, and we actually now know that an, a major impact was responsible for, for wiping out the dinosaurs. And, I'll give you a few examples of how relevant this is. I mean, this is the Chelyabinsk meteor um, that fell about eight years ago. Um, this thing caused immense damage. A bit of this very meteor is here. Um, caused immense damage on Earth. Um, uh, it was only 20 meters in size, and it was fairly, fairly sort of standard rocky material. Now we can go slightly bigger and you use a 50 meter iron projectile, and you get much, much more damage. Um, uh, this is uh, burying a crater in the US. Um, it was created 50,000 years ago, so by geological timescales, that's not long. And it made a massive crater, a reasonably small projectile. Now, Ryugu was several hundred meters in size. What if something that size comes at Earth? And I think um, we want to be prepared for this, and we actually, there are now various ways of looking at sort of mitigating that risk about how we can 
basically mitigate the risk of asteroids hitting us and creating damage. Um, but in, in, at the end of the day, I mean, we, we need to further know the physical properties of these things. And if the, ast uh, if, if the dinosaurs at the time had known, I mean, I'm sure they would have done something about it. But I mean, obviously, um, they, they were too concerned about the cost at the time. And uh, that actually finishes my talk. However, I need to point out that in a few minutes, it'll be Thomas Kuhn talking about snow and ice particles in Kirana and their role for the climate of the Earth. Thank you very much.